All right, it's exactly 10 p.m. on the dot. The second hour of News Hour begins right now. And with me tonight is Dr. Timothy Olwen. He's the chairperson of the Social Health Authority. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for inviting me. This authority has not been understood. What is your mandate? What is this authority about? Well, the Social Health Authority is a body that was uh, formed, established through an act of parliament this year. And just like its predecessor, which is the National Health Insurance Fund, its uh, mandate primarily was financing the provision of health care services in this country. Now, its formation really is a culmination of a series of events. It's just the, gen the public are getting to know about it at this stage, but really it's a series of events. And I'd like to go back all the way to, to, the, to the enactment of our 2010 constitution, which stated that health care is a constitutional right. And that constitutional right included the right to the entire spectrum of health care, but in addition to that, to emergency medical services. Okay. So Subsequent to that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, rights establish duties. And the duty to provide that health care to the citizens of this country falls with the state. And therefore, it became important for us to do a situation analysis, to, to do a situation analysis and find out where there were shortcomings in our current health care system. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, anybody who's been in this country and has got health and knows that healthcare, our healthcare system has got challenges. Okay. We have come a long way, but in addition to that, of course, there are certain glaring gaps which needed to be addressed. Okay. For, yes. for, for me, the biggest challenge that I think needs to be addressed is the financing of healthcare. How dire was this when you went through trying to establish what's wrong with our system? How bad was the problem? Well, financing of healthcare, you see, um, is this is especially when it comes to out of pocket expenditure mm -hmm. out of pocket expenditure from uh, households and from individuals in this country has had the uh, the effect of impoverishing a lot of families out of pocket means maybe i go and pay for my yes. health care at the hospital ideally yes. uh, the ideal situation would be where we refinance health care so you have to increase insurance penetration to the extent that you will limit the number of people who are having to pay out of pocket at the time of seeking service okay it should be pre-financed but however that can only happen if for example you have got a significant pool of individuals okay. who are going to be paying for this insurance health insurance up front mm -hmm. so the pre-financing of health care limits out of pocket expenditure and then you have got contributions also that needs to come in. Mm -hmm. They need to come in regularly, mm -hmm. but they need to come in in an equitable manner. So in terms of equitable financing of healthcare, mm -hmm. at the moment it's very inequitable because first of all, we had a national health insurance fund. The contributions predominantly come from statutory payroll deductions, which means it's a formal sector. Mm -hmm. The informal sector by and large are going to pay contributions erratically or sporadically mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on perceived need and that is the concept that we is often discussed about adverse selection. Okay. When they anticipate they're going to use a service the only time they pay. So they're really being carried, the weight is being carried again by the formal health sector. Okay. So, Okay, so we'd want to look for at a lot of uh, these issues that are captured under the regulations. And uh, most important, for example, is um, uh, the purpose of the Social Health Insurance Fund, initial registration, the registration of beneficiaries, members of the Health uh, Insurance Fund. I know one of the controversial things that I've seen here is uh, the age group that, is, uh, that has been uh, allowed to be a dependent and apart from that when you hit 25 and you don't have money there's so many things that were said here because we know there's a cut-off point that this is including but most important to me is the contribution uh, per person to this but before I get to that I want to ask a few questions out of this um, uh, for example the establishment has sort of been put on eyes of this authority you, what is your day like when you wake up as a chairman of this authority? What is your day like? What do you do? Well, at, at this stage, we are still involved a lot in terms of setting up the authority to be able to get, get all the instruments in place and get it operational fully. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's still a lot of background work and a lot of planning that needs to be done. So much as we have got a legal encumbrance uh, at the moment, we are hoping that will be overcome because the gravity of the, of the implications I believe uh, are things that will be addressed, but of course that is a matter for the legal fraternity to be able to address. Okay, but but still I want to touch on that, that legal encumbrance that you're talking about, where does it leave you? Because I know NHIF has been declared defunct right now, and you're supposed to get this running as authority, running this fund. So what's really happening? I mean, um, 
what's happening to people who want to go to the hospital people who depended on nhif they needed to submit the money there's just some point we were told that the staff have been told to go home what's really happening i, I mean we need a clarification in that like I said, I think I'm hoping that will be resolved because I, the, the implications are grave. Because we're talking about not mm -hmm. being able to finance healthcare, mm -hmm. healthcare activities in this country in this time when we have got this, uh, mm -hmm. this, this order in place. And that is, you can you, you imagine what the implications of that are. You've got people who seek healthcare even as of today. Yeah. There are people in hospital who need the healthcare to be financed. So that is how serious it is. So I'm, I'm, I'm trusting, I'm hoping and praying that this issue is resolved. But how big was a cushion? How big was a question this NHIF? How big was it in terms of providing that cover for people? How big was it? NHIF has done a great job and in fact it, it finances it's actually the biggest payoff for healthcare mm -hmm. in this country as we Was say. it practical? Was it happening really? It was happening. Happening it was. Yeah. And I'm saying NHIF had got its challenges and that's part of the reason why it was necessary mm -hmm. to move on to the new body which is Social Health Authority. Mm -hmm. Because if you go back to, to, to history and I said in terms of mandate, we have, I, I was talking about the constitutional right to health. Yeah. And everybody has to get help when they are, to regain health when they are unwell, mm -hmm. to get treatment when they are unwell, and help when they are dying. So mm -hmm. we're talking about the entire spectrum. Yeah. The challenge we had was, first of all, in terms of prevention and promotion, mm -hmm. the emphasis wasn't there, wasn't sufficient. That's why in this new authority, we have got a primary health care fund, which okay. takes care of prevention and promotion. Mm -hmm. Then you have got the aspect about emergency care as well, mm -hmm. which was not taken care of. We had the Health Act of 2017, mm -hmm. which uh, said that we needed to establish a fund. It was never operationalized. Never, yeah. And a lot of us were agitating for that to be operationalized. And fortunately now with this, we have got an emergency chronic illness and critical care fund. Mm -hmm. Then in addition to that, you have got a lot of people who are exhausting their benefits in the course of uh, obtaining health care. Yeah. When you exhaust your benefits now in this new arrangement, you can be able to segue onto the chronic and critical illness fund. Mm -hmm. So for those people where we were going to have cat catastrophic health expenditure from out of pocket, now you can move on to the emergency chronic and critical illness fund. Mm -hmm. And then the entire spectrum is taken care of because even palliative care, mental health, health services. So it is a very comprehensive package. I see, and that's where I am worried because it's so wide, it brings a lot of things on board and it's never been practiced before in Kenya. So yes. the question is how practical is this proposal it is practical if we get the funding that we require and that the is the funding has to come from the public through the payment yes it does okay and that is why we talk about universal coverage and that's why much as we have got a lot of uh, skepticism about this mm -hmm. i think the idea is noble okay there's a lot of skepticism i do agree but in the absence of us getting universal coverage where everybody's going to be able to contribute towards this fund mm -hmm. it's not going to work because mm -hmm. Let me tell you, it can never be social health insurance. The principles are pretty different from private insurance. Mm -hmm. And the two cannot, uh, private insurance can never substitute for this. Because first, mm -hmm. in private insurance, you'll never get the significant pool of people enough for you not to have exclusions. Here we're talking about providing the entire range of care mm -hmm. throughout your life mm -hmm. without exclusions. For mm -hmm. example, a lot of critical, chronic illnesses and critical illnesses, when you talk about private insurance, they have to put a cap. Yes. On things, isn't you can't go beyond this. You can go beyond this, this and not, sometimes, we don't cover this. yes. Mm -hmm. And the reason is they don't have a significant pool. So, mm -hmm. when you have got a large pool of people, and we have to have a large pool, and that's why it had to, has to be mm -hmm. universal. Okay. So, I know a lot of the measures that have also been controversial is measures that have been seen as 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 forcing people to be able to get social mm -hmm. health insurance to mm -hmm. access other public services. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, in general, there's a responsibility. You know, much as the state has got the responsibility to provide health. Yeah. The state, by the way, also includes the citizens. The state is not government alone. Mm -hmm. Citizens are part of the state. You're even flipping the, it. Even the territory is part of this you're the state. It. Yes. No, you're just so, so there's a responsibility for individuals also. So yeah. we, much as we want to aspire to be able to get this healthcare benefits, mm -hmm. we all, there, there has to be some pain to it. There has to be some money. And, yes. And mm -hmm. therefore, mm -hmm. what we want to encourage as much as possible is that everybody needs to be at least. Mm -hmm. Enlisting and, and if you look at the regulations, what I like about the regulations though mm. is that the lines that are controversial, mm. uh, please clause that are controversial are not that many. We mm. actually have 50 pages of regulations for that SHI, mm. SHI Act alone. Yeah. If you've got only two, three pages that are causing a lot of controversy, I think the people, did a pretty, the people who prepared the regulations actually did a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is those regulations are proposals at the moment. Yeah. They will go to public participation. I'm sure input will be given. But what I would encourage mm -hmm. is people 
to make counter proposals. It's not, not sufficient. Just to come it's not sufficient to just, and, just and, come and say yeah, we don't want this. And this is not working. Because the us. overall objective we've mm -hmm. said is to get everybody, everybody on board. If certain things don't work, mm -hmm. make counter proposals. But the only thing they're rejecting there is money. I'm looking at Rwanda, and I know how their health system works. Compare. I know you've studied Rwanda, as, yes. uh, coming from the private sector. You studied Rwanda. How how did Rwanda do it? Providing, ensuring that they provided the universal health coverage to majority of the citizens. You know, the model, the models that we have are, are different in different countries, mm -hmm. and I would not necessarily say that one model might might work here one hundred percent because our economies are different, our populations are different, our mm -hmm. disease burden is different. So this, what I want to reassure people is that this has been the culmination of a lot of work done by a large team of people over a long period of time. Okay. So what we are seeing is the tail end. And I think there's significant thought that has gone into it to be able to make sure that it solves, it, it cures the problems that we had in our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Whether it's got to do with healthcare financing, whether it's to do with, with, with the scope of the services that we're offering, mm -hmm. whether it's to do with the increase in burden on non-communicable non diseases and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of thought that has gone into it. So okay. what I think is people need to give it a chance mm -hmm. to be able to work. Because if you ask me, we were not in a very good place to begin with. Yeah. So it's not like people are just changing laws or changing bodies because they want to change it. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, a common question people have asked mm -hmm. is why NHIF had to be kind of done away with mm -hmm. and then we started when using we social health authority. It, yes. it was not possible, I think, given if you see the mandate of the social health authority is much wider, it was not possible to tweak the law mm -hmm. to be able to get it done. That's why we, they, they opted to go for this radical transformation. Of okay. course, radical transformation... Managing change is always difficult. It's, it's difficult and that's for the, people that's to accept. Yes. But you agree with me, Dr. Tari, that the biggest component here is uh, the finance. Yes. When you mention finance and people, ah, you want more from my pocket, that's where the resistance yes. begins. I, I believe do. that's where the resistance begins. The contributory part, mm -hmm. the direct contributory part for contributors is actually the Social Health Insurance Fund. Mm -hmm. That is the one that some members fund. The primary health care fund, which is done through level two and three facilities and where you've got the CHP, which, the, which were launched a while, a while ago. CHP? Community health promoters. Okay, promoters. Yes, they okay. Are, that mm -hmm. is that is funded by the exchequer. Mm -hmm. Same with the emergency component because emergency medical treatment mm -hmm. you are entitled to. Everybody is entitled to. Is it possible that the exchequer can fund emergency? Well, you know, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it is about first of all, I think, political goodwill, goodwill and that political okay. goodwill is there, mm -hmm. coming all the way from the top, from His Excellency the President himself. Mm -hmm. So it's about priorities. You know, different governments, different administrations have got different priorities. Mm -hmm. This is a key priority for this. What if I said, because I want from you, I am dangling this? Is that not the case? Because I'm asking for you for more money to put into this, then I'm dangling this, that I'll provide this as the exchequer. You know, you know, I, I know there's, like I said, the skepticism here comes from we are, we are doing prospective, we are promising people stuff mm -hmm. and we have not delivered anything because we're new. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I understand where that is coming from. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that I think we have got a good plan in place, the goodwill is there, mm -hmm. the intention is noble, mm -hmm. it has been well thought through, and the implementation, if we get the funding, should be able to work. I mm -hmm. think Kenyans should give this a chance. This is going, I have a question here from uh, Beldin, who is one of our reporters here. She does health reporting. So she's asking, is it true that there's a private company that has been hired to oversee the insurance fund? A private company to oversee the insurance fund? Yes. No, that is not There's true. no private, it's public, full time. This, it is run by the Social Health Authority. Yeah. Possibly the component they're talking about, it might be something to do with management of claims. Of claims. And okay. claims management mm -hmm. has been also very clearly defined in the regulations, if you see. Okay. It's been clearly defined what correct criteria will be used, and it is an option of May. Mm -hmm. If the authority decides to outsource that function, they will mm -hmm. outsource it, but it has to be to a medical so insurance it's a discretion of, of the, the social authority. authority yes okay a medical insurance provider or a claim settling agent mm -hmm. so we're saying in terms of managing the administrative issues in terms of claims management that also and again the country has been divided into zones so that the load that even any single mm -hmm. medical insurance provider or claims management agent can can manage mm -hmm. is limited okay. and they all have to be registered so by that's the insurance a check on it. regulatory authority that's a check yes that's, so a check. that's why i said there's a lot of thought that has gone into this mm -hmm. yeah because someone would ask then does it not mean that this has been engineered to benefit a, a certain individual or corporation or company to manage the claims you know well in terms of you see first of all one of the one of the biggest challenges was to, to increase the operational efficiency 
efficiency, for example, with our predecessor, was to bring down the administrative costs. Okay. And that administrative cost, sometimes to bring it down, means get somebody who is most efficient at managing it. Mm -hmm. That's where the outsourcing component comes in. Mm -hmm. Now, if you outsource it to people and you've got very good metrics for performance, I think the risk is low, and especially when we have decided, divided the load also again, mm -hmm. and said we are spreading that risk and saying you cannot take beyond one zone. Beyond. Okay, so it's not, it's not a one-man show. No, it's well, not a one-man show. Well, um, the other component of payment is, um, um, uh, she's also asking, the informal sector, uh, the proposal in the regulations probably is the informal sector should be paying annually. Yes. Yet, they say their income is not predictable. Mm -hmm. uh, how will that work? Now, the reasoning behind this, again, uh, uh, like I alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. is we have got a lot of erratic contributions coming from the informal sector, so to speak. Okay. And it's one of those where if Ken knows that he has been diagnosed with diabetes today, he'll go and pay for any child cover. That's what is the practice. Mm -hmm. Because now he needs he's going, he's going to need it. Mm -hmm. Everybody else who at that point are healthy do mm -hmm. not pay. Mm -hmm. This cannot be able to sustain the system. So yeah. the reasoning was to be able to get people to give annual contributions so that you, the income flows are more predictable, mm -hmm. and then again it's more universal. Okay. Now, the, the proviso that was put in there was that mm -hmm. we want to be able to get premium financing products that are affordable mm -hmm. to people so that they have got this option of being able to pay mm -hmm. that, pay the, the premium financing provider in installments, mm -hmm. but the payment comes to the social health authority up front. Okay. That's the only way to make sure that the contributions are, contributions you, are regular. This, you know, talking to you, it sounds like this thing is well thought of. So my, at the back of my mind, I'm asking, why is it that we don't understand this? But another question... That's the reason I'm here, Ken. <laughs> because, question, unfortunately, yeah. in terms of promoting awareness, yeah. this is where we started off. We'll continue in earnest over the public participation period. Mm -hmm. And I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to get people to understand, to understand more yeah. about what the new authority but, but, is all but about. But still, um, I'm, I'm looking at those people who used to have comprehensive, all those components that have been reintroduced, which I said is a carrot. You know, give us, then we'll give you this. But there are those people who had comprehensive cover, right? They are very good companies that give comprehensive cover why should they be made to contribute into this why can't it be voluntary i know it's a pool that you want to pull from so that uh, a, a, a thousand people pay in but only two people fall sick and they can get comprehensive medical attention what they need but why should the other people who already have comprehensive out of government be forced to be in this pool? the principle of social health insurance is that those who are more well endowed financially will pay for those who are not. The young will pay for the old because it's assumed that the disease, disease burden increases as you're old. As you get older. So that's mm -hmm. the principle of social... So I, I think it's just one of these things that we have to take mm -hmm. as a responsibility mm -hmm. as members of the public. Okay. Yes. So there are other areas that were not covered before. It's a sure thing that they'll be covered in this. Yes, that's what I've told you right now. Yeah. It's covering the entire sp spectrum. Everything. So I can, uh, uh, with this, once it's operationalized, I will not go to a hospital and they you say, know, one hey, of the no. things that we also anticipate mm -hmm. is the cost, the, the total health expenditure is actually supposed to go down. Mm -hmm. One of the reasonings behind going to, to preventive and promotive health mm -hmm. is that it reduces the disease burden downstream. Prevention is going to save us a lot of money that yeah. we're already spending. That's a key component. Yes, and especially there. for non-communicable disease. You mm -hmm. see, we are at the stage where a lot of the, the so-called developed countries were a while ago, mm. where now we are not worrying too much about communicable disease. Mm. Now we've gotten to the point where non-communicable disease... Are you worried about, why, why are you worried about prevention? Because we know there are agencies that were dealing with majorly preventions. Mm -hmm. Is that bucket or, or, or basket shrinking? Because now you want the money to be available and not look outside to get money, especially t for the preventive component of this. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why this is also being funded by the Exchequer. But I've said in terms of prevention, mm -hmm. we can be able to save a lot of money downstream so that we minimize our expenditure. But there are also other measures that have been taken to bring down this total uh, health expenditure. Mm -hmm. There's also the aspect of the cost of health care. Mm -hmm. If you look at what is causing the cost of health care to become mm -hmm. extremely high in our country, first you will see that you've got, for example, a lot of the healthcare inputs, like, for example, health commodity supply. Mm. A lot of them are imported mm. at prices which are exorbitant. So what, what we want to do is also local, bolster local manufacturing as one of the endeavors to make sure that we bring down cost of healthcare mm -hmm. in our country. So it's a whole uh, array of interventions that are meant to combined, bring down total health expenditure, mm -hmm. but in addition to that, also make sure that people have got health care throughout their lives as is enshrined in our country. I'll take you back to the prevention. Yes. Why is it included in this component? Because, as I said, I know there are 
other agencies that were key in promoting and funding the prevention yes. of several diseases, yes. right? So why do you have to include it? It in was the not the, the, the impact. The impact of the agencies that were doing it, mm -hmm. much as it was adding value, yeah. it was not to the extent that it's going to have an impact on our total ex expenditure to a significant component. Primary healthcare is not a new thing, by the way. No, this not. was brought up from 1978. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things in healthcare, the recurrent themes, you know, universal health coverage, health for all by the year 2000 and so on, mm -hmm. they're not new things. It's just that we've never gotten it right. And for me, I think this is an opportunity for us to get it right. Mm -hmm. An opportunity, why? Because first of all, like I said, with the new administration that came into place, mm -hmm. the, this is a priority for them. It is a priority, and a lot of the time, without the support from the top, it is not going to happen. Let me give you an example. Do you think ordinarily, if this was not a priority, do you mm -hmm. think ordinarily someone like me would be sitting here as a chair of, I of the social health authority? Sector. Good question. There has been need to be able, if you look at even the constitution or composition of our board, it has been so professionalized to the extent that it was tailored to be able to deliver on the mandate that it has. Mm -hmm. What happens to the funds that will come from the external agencies? Will it be included and how will it be managed and how will it be accounted for? Those because the, I assume yes. they will fall yes, under your basket. Support. Also. Yes. So other than the funding that comes from locally, mm -hmm. this agency, the Social Health Authority, is still going to be able to accept what, whatever you call them, donations mm -hmm. or grants, and they're also going to go towards the same functions mm -hmm. that we are talking about here. There's always been concerns about the management. I remember some years ago there was an agency that was withdrawing because of accusations of misuse of funds that were donated in form of grants, right? Yes. So uh, what is the accountability threshold for this? Because I'm thinking, it's not us contributing. We don't, uh, we, we, we would ordinarily not audit them. They'll audit themselves. They send you money, they audit how you used it. Yes. But what is, is the board still going to be accountable for the money that comes from outside? Is all, it under your mandate? All the more reason why we are talking about a totally new body. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we, ha we have what to learn from the experiences of the past. Yeah. So in terms of, first of all, if you look at, for example, a lot of the penalties that have been introduced for being able to, for any, anything to do with corruption or mismanagement of funds, mm -hmm. the penalties in this new law, this mm -hmm. new act, and this new... Give me an example. Give me an stiff. example. Even for, for, for example, for fraud. Mm -hmm. For fraud by... NHI, health. like there yes. was several fraud. Yes, uh, by individuals, reported. by yeah. health facilities. They yeah. are steep. I mean, even for individuals, you go up to, up to penalties of up to 2 million shillings of jail for a while. So, okay. it's, so one thing I'm looking forward to is that, first of all, we have to cut out the leakage. Because a lot of the resources that we have in our environment also mm -hmm. have been lost yeah. to things that are not going towards healthcare. Leakage has got to be cut. We have got to become more efficient, mm. reduce those administrative costs, and mm. make sure that the, a lot of the funds that are collected, the majority of them, go towards delivering on the money, mm. providing mm -hmm. for healthcare provision for the king. You, you said, um, you asked me, you posed a very good question. Um, would you think that someone like me would be sitting here and, and uh, being a chairperson of that authority? I want to remind you uh, when you were in the uh, private sector, right? Yeah. You were one of the people who were on the forefront uh, castigating how NHIF, NHIF was not working. Mm. And then now mm. you come and a similar authority, forget yes. about similar authority, and now you're in a position uh, that uh, you are looking at it from the inside. Yes. Not at the time you were looking at it from the outside, but it had so many issues. How, how different are someone who previously criticized how this was working, now you're in the inside, how different are you going to do this? I've been in this healthcare space for 30 years. Mm -hmm. I've advocated for policy change from the outside as what I would call an exogenous policy entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. All I have given is an opinion which has never been listened to. Mm -hmm. This time the approach was different. Yeah. I said... I want to be an endogenous policy entrepreneur. That's the most effective kind. Mm -hmm. So when there was this change in mindset, and I'll tell you where it came from, there was a health forum which was held um, by this current administration when they were still campaigning. Okay. Our stand, our stand even as an organization then was apolitical, right? Mm -hmm. But my opinion was, regardless of which administration, which of the two leading formations was going to form government, our mm -hmm. issues needed to be at the table. Mm -hmm. So I went and, you made it clear for I both went of them. and get a presentation. Mm -hmm and articulated all the issues that I thought were a problem with the current system mm -hmm. and the solutions and so on. And mm -hmm. that is part of the reason I believe mm -hmm. I am here today. You're appointed for it. Yes. Because now from the inside, you know, it's easy to criticize from outside. Yes. When you are in the middle of it, now you have to but deal with it. But the beauty also is, yes. like I said, mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily even fixing the previous organization from the inside. Mm -hmm. I have got an opportunity here mm -hmm. to be part of making a new organization okay. that is bespoke that is tailor-made to be able to solve the, solve the problem. You have the good way. 
I have got the goodwill. I, the mere fact that I've been appointed, I believe I have the goodwill. Okay. Yes. So um, the other question is, having been in private sector, you own in a hospital, don't you think there could be um, a conflict of interest, especially looking at the commercial um, aspect of this? For the people who you represented in the Yes, past, yes. Yeah. There is, I've, I've got a legal team that is looking at that. Okay. First of all, I think as per the law as it is now, mm -hmm. if there was obvious conflict or contravention of the law, mm -hmm. I would have been appointed. Okay. But secondly, I think just to be able to tidy up things, I will have to cede my interests okay. in those private organizations because you don't want any, any decisions. Of course, there's always room in board meetings if you've got an interest you can declare, but you want to make it look like this. No, you don't want there to be any insinuations that there's any conflict mm -hmm. in the manner in which you're conducting it. Mm -hmm. So your motivation is change and to ensure that the a healthcare provision and funding works. That's your motivation. You see, there's yeah. no reason, let me tell you, mm -hmm. I would not leave leaving the private sector to be able to come into public public office or public service at this age. Mm -hmm. It would have to be that I'm going to make a difference. Only? Yes. No motivation? It would have to be that I'm going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, there's no other reason I'd be here. Okay. So tell us the silent things about um, the new outfit that you people are creating that perhaps is of benefit and we don't totally see it but from where you sit i know you've told us a number of them from where you sit you say ultimately this is the goal if kenyans are able to be convinced even this component of financing will never be an issue to us we want to achieve universal health coverage universal health coverage is an aspirational goal and everybody in fact that is something that almost all countries aspire to universal health coverage has three, got three components one is people to be able to access healthcare when and when they need it, when and where they need it. Mm -hmm. If you look at our country right now, we've got such such serious disparities in healthcare resource distribution mm -hmm. that is not acceptable. Okay. In fact, it's like night and day. You might have some parts of the country where you can walk, you can find a health facility within uh, literally 100 meters of where you are, mm -hmm. and the other places where you, it might be 100 kilometers. So those disparities, first of all, need to be resolved. So there's the issue of access to healthcare when you, when and where you need it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there's the aspect of the quality of healthcare that we get, because it is not just Bora Afia; it has to be Afia Bora. So it is about getting healthcare, healthcare service, services of a quality that is sufficient to be effective. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, there's the aspect of financial risk protection where people should not suffer financial hardship when accessing these services. Mm -hmm. Now, that is UHC and that's the overarching goal. So UHC, now you can go for healthcare system to be able to be assessed in terms of, it has to be comprehensive. Comprehensive in terms of scope, because you're getting universal health coverage, you're getting the entire gamut of services, then you also have to, has to be progressive. And that has got to be the financing which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. The financing has to be equitable. Mm -hmm. Ideally, those who earn more should pay a, a greater proportion of their earnings mm -hmm. than those who earn less. That's otherwise, otherwise right yes, mm -hmm. otherwise it's going to be regressive. Or in fact, what has been proposed at the moment looks like it's proportional because we're talking about a 2.75% across the board. Across the board but yeah. that is for the Kenyan people to decide mm -hmm. and give their input and, and then we'll see what happens mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. Then there's the aspect about uh, it has to be reliable. The healthcare system has to be reliable. Reliable in terms of it delivers what it promises you give. It must also meet, it must be responsive. When you go to a healthcare facility, let it meet your expectations. So if you go there with this and this problem, let you come out of that healthcare facility feeling satisfied and then it has to be sustainable. So any measures that we put in place, and that's one of the challenges about this financing, the reason why the financing is important, if we have a program that is able to be funded and it lasts for one year and then collapses, serves no purpose. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something that's sustainable and that's why you'll find even for example the tariffs are going to be dependent, the tariffs, the rates that are going to be paid are going to be dependent on the kind of uh, cash inflows that we expect from or projections we expect from from the rates that are going to be proposed. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so what if I'm looking at, uh, okay before I ask you that question take us to the next step. I know there's something in court happening. We'll not mention about that. But these are regulations. What is the next step for these regulations? Because they are regula they are proposed. Yes. They're not cast the in stone. Regulations, once yeah. they come out, we're supposed to be public participation. Mm -hmm. and that public participation, I think it's, 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 it's pretty clear in terms of the law. To what extent you should do it, we have to engage stakeholders, mm -hmm. key stakeholders in the health health care, basically anybody who is going to be affected and the general public. Mm -hmm. They have got to give their views on the regulations. So what I would propose is even as we have got this uh, legal matter in court, mm -hmm. 
let people be going through the regulations if they've got access to them, at least viewing them. And it's good that we're getting feedback from the public, which means it is generating interest. Yeah. But the regulations is a bulky document. And I told you I'm even, I'm even quite uh, impressed that the sticky issues are not that many. Yeah. So once that is done, once the public participation is done, these are supposed to go back and they go through the, the legislative bodies In and parliament. then it's going to be yeah. gazetted by the minister. And then we are ready to roll. Ready to roll. What if, what if uh, Kenyans reject these regulations? Are you back to the drawing board? I don't think they would totally reject the regulations. I don't think that is possible because a lot of the regulations that are put in there, by the way, are fairly straightforward. Some of them are actually really even similar to what we had with NHIF. NHIF yeah. So there might be some impact in terms of the amount of funding that we can be able to get. Mm -hmm. So that might impact the benefits we're able to deliver. So it's an Meaning issue. Meaning they want that reversed from 2.7%. Yes. And if low. that happens, for example, it mm -hmm. might very well mean that, again, the benefits package has to change. change. Okay. So the benefits we're offering. So at the end of the day, we'll work with whatever mm -hmm. the Kenyan people decide. Mm -hmm. And that is also not within my mandate. A lot of these things, for example, in terms of the enacting the law and the regulations and so on, mm -hmm. is a public type function and with the legislative bodies and mm -hmm. with government. Mm -hmm. But we will work with whatever we get. Mm -hmm. We'll see what benefits we can deliver. Mm -hmm. But we are keen to deliver on what we tell provide. me something what was the rationale for this percentage for the percentage yes i think it is based on the financial projections so you look at for example we've got an annual total health expenditure of 550 billion a year for example okay, so health. you're saying yep. we want to say that if we've got these three different funds we look at the functions that they want to perform mm -hmm. we say this is our financial target mm -hmm. how do we meet it based on the population for example 50 million mm -hmm. this number of households and so on mm -hmm. so there's a lot of uh, again math that went into it it's not a figure that's someone just, just woke up and out said, of the hat mm, yes 2.7 percent yes 2.7 is a good number no yeah. that's not how it came about mm -hmm. but that's the reasoning behind it so how much in in your uh, in your estimation if this goes through will you be able to be for example collecting annually you for the for example for a lot of the a lot of the funds like for the social health insurance fund we, the targets, I think, are in the tune. I'll have to check the figures, but mm -hmm. in the tune of 150 billion. Then you've got the primary health care fund, mm -hmm. maybe a, a 50, 50 billion, then 75 for the emergency mm -hmm. and critical illness fund. So total comes to just under 300 yes. billion. To and that's sufficient. What is the cu currently, how much is the government giving out for universal health care? In terms of the budgeted amount. I would not want to delve too much into the figures at the mm -hmm. moment, but I believe, you see, of the total health expenditure, about mm -hmm. a certain percentage, possibly 50, 60 percent, yeah, is funded from a certain current. component. So, mm -hmm. are, like mm -hmm. I said, there's a lot of math that went into it, but during the public participation, there will also be experts mm -hmm. who will be there who will delve into more of these numbers and give more visibility in terms. That is of interest, because I can, if I think of the amount of money that was allocated to health, and the amount of money targeted is already is too much, but I know it's the whole component including the recurrent expenditure and all that so how how let's say this works mm -hmm. how are we going to work in terms of even creating additional infrastructures where are they going to draw this money from because you said um it's necessary to ensure that even healthcare comes closer some people get it 10 meters away 100 meters away some people 100 yes. kilometers away yes how will you ensure that works because it's also important uh, does the budget also goes to finance infrastructure you see a lot of the time, a lot of the infrastructure, you see first of all health is a devolved function. Mm -hmm. So already as it is, part of the infrastructure is already being handled by the counties and that's their responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because as far as I'm concerned, that is part of their mandate. Now, one of the things that is important about this fund, for example, in, in sorting out these regional disparities, mm -hmm. the moment, for example, you've got community health promoters going out into the field yeah. and being able to be able to see people out in the field, that already provides some level of health care. Then, in addition to that, you've got the level two and three facilities. There's another bill which was uh, called the Facility Improvement Financing Bill. Mm -hmm. That also helps to ring fence funds for medical facilities. So it improves the resources that are available locally. Mm -hmm. Healthcare, all the time, for example, when you come to talk about uh, health, human resource, resources for health, a lot of the time, unfortunately, like in any business, mm -hmm. it follows the money. As long as the money is available, people will flow into those areas because they want to tap into Medical, it. Yeah. Part of the problem we have in this country now is we have got healthcare that is so urbanized and in fact you'll find almost 60% in, in certain specialties for example 60-80% are in Nairobi alone right so you find even people outside even the other urban areas outside Nairobi don't have access to these services mm -hmm. if for example resources were able to flow into those areas it would act as a stimulus for people to be able to even help human resources and uh, health personnel to be able to go to those areas so over time these things are going to these benefits are going to flow okay and yes. we, we're likely to see them 
Uh, so, so much for the opportunities. I guess you have also looked at it and identified a few challenges that um, the establishment, establishment of a completely new outfit poses for Kenyans. What will that be? Well, the, chal the challenge is, is, is that it is going to it is it is takes a lot it is going to take a little bit of time for people to see the real effects you know some of these are for example some medium term measures mm -hmm. it's not like we're going to start today mm -hmm. and overnight people are saying wow there's a lot of change it's going to take something one and a half to a year one and a half years to two three years they for you to see the real effects for mm -hmm. example in fact when you invest in primary health care it's not like you see the benefits immediately because that disease burden doesn't drop mm -hmm. and calm down immediately. So it is going to take a little bit of patience, okay. all right? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the challenges because I know, especially when it's a new outfit and when you've got some of the uh, history of the predecessor mm -hmm. that is going to be tailing you, people will say, oh, we, we knew it was mm -hmm. just same old, same old. Mm -hmm. So that, that level of skepticism. But I think in terms of promoting awareness, and that's one of the things that we need to do, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here even today, is people need to know what the plan is. Yeah. People need to know what the plan is. Mm -hmm. People need to know what safeguards have been put in place to ensure that we don't go back to the previous, uh, to the previous state that we were. And uh, just take a lot of goodwill. Mm -hmm. It will need a lot of goodwill from the Kenyan people and a lot of goodwill from the top to be able to push this agenda. Let me ask you, uh, NHIF is defunct, but there were funds there. Where is this fund? Well, uh, uh, by, by operation of law, the moment uh, that... Uh, that, that the so-called appointed date of the 22nd of September, all those funds, mm -hmm. all those assets and everything in terms of liabilities yeah. transferred to the social, social okay. health authority. Okay. Yes. So, so, so it's not like they, have, uh, they, are, still, they are still there. But this authority mm. has no backing of the law as at now. So how are you handling the fund? And that's why, to, uh, that's, that's, why I told, that's why I told you at the moment we're in a, a, a precarious position. So I'm hoping that legal encumbrance okay, is, no one, is yeah. resolved and resolved urgently. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, because no one, so as we are, no one is managing the funds mm -hmm. as <laughs> per the code order. So, Iko <laughs> We're in a state of limbo. By the time you get a um, uh, go-ahead, mm -hmm. you think we'll still be in a good place? Because no one is checking. I mean, at the back, probably there are things that are, that are happening, right? Mm. But forefront to now, now there's nothing that is happening. <laughs> so by the time you get that, go ahead. No, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's reason for concern. We have got, uh, we have got systems. systems in place to ensure <laughs> system. that. <laughs> yeah. It's not like things are going to move overnight. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Okay. So one of the challenges that you, you said that you said you were challenged, but one of the challenges that has been identified also sent to me here is the claims and how the claims will be handled. And from this viewer, they think there'll be a lot of opportunities for corruption as hospitals will be asking for more than the staff because it's open now. It's open. You know, um, previously, there were even diseases that were not accounted. It's open. I mean, I can write anything. If we go back to how, for example, there was fraud under NHIF, it's because of that window. So in this, there's a concern about corruption and hospitals probably um, billing for more than they're treating and all that. What are the safeguards for this? Let me tell you, there's a very robust healthcare, health, health management information system that is that is going to be put in place that if anything mm -hmm. that's one of the key things that is going to be diminished not increased mm -hmm. because there's a whole chain of um of, of of systems that have been put in place to ensure that we've got all the way from identification of patients to the biometrics to the entire gamut of things so in terms of the claims management mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons why we, enhancing operational efficiency fraud i'm saying we're learning from the previous system and mm -hmm. these systems were designed to curb such things so i would want to allay those fears Kenyans are still Kenyans. Yes. Yeah. They still, like, there could be, there could be um, cases of fraud. And there's no system that's 100% foolproof. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. However, that level of fraud is going to diminish drastically. What is the biggest avenue for fraud? Because you said you studied the failures of the previous system. Yes. What was the biggest avenue for fraud under NHIF? You see, fraud, fraud is, uh, it takes two to tango. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, the fraud was always in collusion with people within the system, mm -hmm. right? And unfortunately, um, a lot of the systems that were put in place were also manual and amenable to, to manipulation. So, mm -hmm. those things have been taken care of in terms of the new system. How long did it take to develop this system? Now I have to ask that question because you said there's so many people who've been involved. There's so many hours that the work on this the work on this project started start, started if you are, started in 2021. 
it started, like I said, mm -hmm. as a campaign. First of all, it was uh, for the Kenya Kwanzaa campaign, and that was part of their campaign. That's where the ideas came from. But even after they have come into office, mm -hmm. it has been worked on continuously. Even as we speak, mm -hmm. there are still teams that are working, working on, for example, the tariffs that are going to be levied. This work on the regulations was finished just a short, short while ago. Mm -hmm. They're still working on the tariff. So it is a continuous process where a huge team that is drawn from. I don't want it to look like we've got a team of three, four, five people sitting mm -hmm. in a room somewhere. Mm -hmm. It is and a huge team mm -hmm. involving people from NHIF itself, mm -hmm. involving people from the Ministry of Health, in, we've all meet, meet people from the office of the president, mm -hmm. advisors from State House, we've got the state law office, we've got legal teams, so it is an entire, and we've also got development partners, including the World Bank and USAID who have been involved in this project. So mm -hmm. a lot of people are involved in the development of these things, so there's a lot of thought that has gone into it. Mm -hmm. A lot of safeguards have been put in place, and you see, for example, mm -hmm. development partners, like you said, are also going to be very interested that the funds they're going to be putting inside these are, are going to be secured and be used for the right purpose. You have a huge task ahead. Mm -hmm. You're parting short. Like I said, I think the healthcare challenges that we had in our system, first of all, our situation analysis were not in a good place. There are certain things that needed to be cured. Mm -hmm. The healthcare challenges were defined. Solutions were crafted to cure those challenges. Then you have got the assembly of a team the intention is to assemble a team that can be able to deliver on that promise. Mm -hmm. We have got legislation, not just policy, but this time it's legislation that is acted into law. And therefore we formed this new body that is mandated to provide the entire spectrum of healthcare needs for the Kenyan people. Yeah. So I want Kenyans to be able to give us a chance to be able to deliver on this. Dr. Timothy Lane, thank you so much for coming and sharing the perspective. This is a conversation that cannot end. And I'm looking forward to the time you'll get, get the green light and this will be actioned, especially after public participation and going through all that legislative process and this becomes law. I'm looking forward to host you again just to understand how you move from there because there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of apprehension and there's those people who are saying, ah, like every other project. And you said this is a, a, a project of this government, like many other projects that they told us will happen have not happened. I'm hoping that when we sit down again, you will now be free to speak because I know I'll, again there's that court issue so you're a little bit gagged <laughs> because of the court <laughs> issue yet the center of interest is exactly that so yes. thank you so much for coming thanks for inviting me Asante sana. And